Dear Church, scattered across our region and province, I know you're losing hope. You're missing each other. Wondering if this season will ever end. I'm writing to encourage you not to give up. There are so many experiences I could share with you. I could tell you about the time we got caught in a storm on the Sea of Galilee and a storm just swept in. We honestly thought that we were going to die. Then Jesus appears out of nowhere. We thought he was a ghost. I'll admit it to you, I squealed a little bit. <laughs> then Jesus says, take courage. It is I. I don't know how, but instantly I felt that courage. I said, Jesus, if it's you, call me out to you. Come, he said. I got out of the boat and I was doing it. I was walking on the water and it felt like an eternity. If the other guys tell you that I fell right away, they're making it up. Don't believe them. I was walking on the water, but yes, the storm started to roar and I started to sink. Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed me. I'll never forget what he said to me. As he held me above the waves, he said, You of little faith, why did you doubt? I've learned to never doubt the Son of God. Or I could tell you about the time where it finally clicked for me that Jesus is the one who would save us. He was asking us, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And I said, Jesus, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. That day he gave me a nickname, Rock. Rocky, they called me. <laughs> I'd love to say it was because of my chiseled physique. You should have seen me in my younger days. But he said, Peter, Rock. That's your name. And on this rock, I'll build my church. And he promised us his followers, his community, his gathering would never end. What great hope. There's so many miracles and healings and teachings that I could recall. But, but I'm sure that I'd run out of paper if I tried to record them all. So many things that I have witnessed over the years. I remember the transfiguration. Jesus takes us up a mountain and the glory of God is shining all around us. Elijah, Moses, right there. And then God's voice comes down to us. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. God, I'm doing it. I'm doing my best to listen to him. Well, 90% of the time never forget the night that they took him away. I tried to stop them and fight the guards off, but Jesus said, stop it. All he wanted us to do was to stay there and pray. I couldn't even keep my eyes open. Worse yet, the second they asked me if I belonged to him, I disowned him faster than you can say traitor. It was the worst day of my life. Three days later, the best day of my life. Yeah, I know, Johnny Boy will tell you, he got to the tomb first. But ask him who went in first. You'll never believe the look on our face when we realize it's true. Exactly what Jesus said would happen came true. He rose again. It was amazing. I remember a little while later, we're on the beach and Jesus asked me to go for a walk. Who doesn't love a good long walk on the beach? But this one was different. He kept on asking me, Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you know that I love you. Simon, feed my sheep. And so, years later, here I am, writing this letter and trying to feed his sheep hoping that it offers you some sort of encouragement. I could fill pages or, or hours around a campfire sharing story after story about how Jesus proved we could trust him. But I think, now that I'm a little bit older, I just don't know if that 
that'd be the best use of my time. And besides, my son Mark, uh, our friends Matthew and Luke, they wrote great accounts. John's, eh, it was kind of weird. A little different. I think the thing that I want to start this letter with, the thing that you, the scattered and scared church, need to hear, may grace and peace be yours in abundance. Grace and peace multiply. Sincerely, your friend, Simon Peter. Rocky. Simon Peter's got to be up there as one of the top favorite people in the Bible, does he not? I mean, the things that he did, the experiences he had, the lessons he learned, walking on water, then just about drowning, uh, telling Jesus you're the Christ, then getting called Satan, <laughs> the, being a part of the transfiguration, what would that have been like, denying Jesus, then seeing Jesus after he rose again, and being restored being the person to preach that famous sermon, the very first sermon after Jesus had gone to heaven that really started the church, 3,000 people get saved. Peter had some incredible highs and some unbelievable lows. I think that's what makes him so relatable for us because at times, doesn't life feel like it's this series of, of hills and valleys? And Peter's a guy who can relate to that. By the time he writes 1 Peter, uh, the first letter that he writes, history tells us that Simon is in his last couple of years alive. He's not quite as impetuous as his younger days. He, he sees the tides changing. He, he recognizes there's some animosity toward Christianity, and he's probably not going to be around forever. And so he picks up his pen to write a letter to his friends, or his quill, or whatever he was using back then. And even today, getting a letter from a loved one, it, is, it just makes us feel warm, doesn't it? You open the mail, and a letter falls out, and you're so excited. You, you open your phone, and you have a DM from one of your best buddies. It, it's such a great feeling. When, I, when Aaron and I started dating, um, a few weeks after, I went on a mission trip to Guatemala, and we were young, and we were in love. And so we decided we'll write each other every single day. And we love that feeling, getting, getting mail from somebody we care about, getting a letter. We also understand what it's like to be apart, not just for a couple of weeks, for a trip, but for months now, for combined months on top of months on top of months, for like a year being apart. And Peter, when he wrote this letter in 1 Peter, He's writing to people in Roman provinces in the first century, modern-day Turkey, who'd been scattered for all sorts of reasons. And they could relate to what some of us are feeling, this feeling of separation, feelings of loss, anxiety, frustration, suffering that maybe some of you have as well. They could relate to that. Have you ever noticed that when things are going from bad to worse, there always seems to be one optimist? The family decides to go on a vacation. And this is the person who's up at 4 a.m. just chirping away like a bird. And then you get in the car, you're driving for a while, one of the tires blows. Oh, it's okay, don't worry, it's going to be a great, we have a backup tire. We'll put the spare on, it'll all be good. You make your way to a restaurant, you stop for some food, you have to wait for like an hour. The food gets there, it's cold. Oh, no, no, mine was delicious, it was just fine. I, it was worth the wait. <laughs> Like, come on, person. Like, seriously. You keep going. You finally get to the place where you're going to have vacation, and it's pouring rain. <laughs> All right, looks like it's an inside day. Don't worry, I brought board games. <laughs> How can you be such an optimist? You have that? You know that person? If you're looking around for the optimist in the room, chances are, that's right, you're them. As a pastor during COVID, I sometimes feel like I'm supposed to be that optimist. And, and some of you know this, I can sometimes be a glass half empty person. And, and I know 
I've talked on the phone with, with some of you. I, I, some of us are struggling, and it's difficult at times to find ways to encourage. I don't know about you. Do you get glass half empty syndrome sometimes? Don't get me wrong. There are tons of reasons that we can be encouraged. We just saw that video from Nate, and Nate, I w- want to welcome you, buddy. You're up in the balcony. It's so exciting to be a part of your team, uh, to have you join the Calvary family. Uh, by the way, you are used to the Rocky Mountains. That's a pretty nice view. Well, we have our own mountains, okay, buddy? You're going to love the escarpment. Pretty much the same thing. We also have these camps that we've been planning. Our interns, they've been putting in all this work, and we can't wait to see what our summer camps are going to be like. There's lots of reasons that we can be encouraged, but there are other things going on in some of our lives that really they're hard, they're discouraging. I I don't know about you, but as I've been talking with people, this stay at home, there's something about it, all the false starts that we've had, it just feels like it's one of the heaviest ones. And then they're making these projections about when we'll be able to open things up and it's a lot longer than any of us had hoped. And then you think about school plans. Do we get to go back to school? Do we not go back to school? Is it just at home? Summer plans, again, for the second summer, we're changing our plans. Uh, Insert the thing that has you stressed out right now. Maybe it has nothing to do with COVID. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's your work or lack of work. could be all sorts of reasons, but it's easy to just start to feel like this is a heavy season. If you can relate to any of those sentiments, then Peter's letter is for you. I'd encourage you, open up to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're starting a series today. Hopefully you realize it's going to be in Peter. We called it Simon Says because, you know, Simon Says. And no, Simon Peter, he's not just an unrealistic optimist. What he wants us to realize as he writes this letter to a scattered, suffering people with so many reasons why they could lose hope, he wants to show them why they're still good news. Why they can keep their hope. And so let's read the first couple verses, just two verses today we're going to go through at the beginning of 1 Peter and see what Simon says. Why don't you read the passage with me? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkle with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Peter writes this letter to the scattered, suffering church, and he starts by saying, grace and peace be yours in abundance. How is it possible for God's people to have grace and peace when they're scattered and suffering? Where, what, show me this peace that you're talking about. Why should we believe Peter when he says grace and peace is possible in your situation? Well, because this isn't just Peter writing. Did you see how he started the letter? That very first line, hey, it's Peter here. Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle literally means the sent one, the messenger. In the earlier church, the apostles were the guys who lived with Jesus, who who saw his teaching, who, who were handed his teaching and then told, I want you to pass it on. They saw him die. They lost probably a lot of hope, but then they saw him raised again. And Jesus gives them this mission. They're real witnesses tasked with passing on his life and his message to other people. Peter begins this letter by reminding us of his calling. This is Peter here on assignment for Jesus. He had witnessed so many times when Jesus brought grace and peace into his life. When he didn't think it would be possible... And he was finally at the end of his life at this place where he said, no, it is possible. You can trust Jesus. He'll give you grace and peace. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been called as well. Just as Peter was a sent one, an apostle, so we are God's sent ones. Remember, uh, we opened up the tank last week and we had this baptism of Hannah and we were all celebrating and what we talked about is how she was starting a new life. Old Hannah has died. New Hannah has been raised to life. And that's our story when we believe in Jesus. Uh, but a part of that is that now you go and tell that story. Jesus' story of how he changed your life. You're a sent one. 
you're called. We're on assignment, or we've been handed this mission uh, from Jesus. Now, I've been praying, some of you will know this, I've been praying since I got here that God would raise up apes at Calvary. And no, I'm not hoping for a bunch of monkeys around this place, but Ephesians 4 talks about how, how the church in unison is just this beautiful picture. And one of the things Paul talks about there is apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherd, teachers, and, and how these are all people who are supposed to equip the church to be doing the work of ministry. And I've been praying, God, would you bring us these apes, these people who, who have this calling, these, these apostles who are ready to break ground for the kingdom of God and, and see people saved and see see the church grow and and see amazing people who feel that they've been called by God to be sent ones Lord would you bring us prophets people who are willing to in a very very gray culture speak truth to be prophets would you bring us evangelists people who have a heart for the lost those who don't realize they need Jesus he's the only way to be saved would you would you bring people who who just want to see more and more people in relationship with Jesus, evangelists, would you bring us shepherds and teachers and people who, who care? People who just want to take care of the sheep, of the, the flock, the, the church of Jesus. And, and this has been a prayer since day one, and God has been answering that prayer. He's put it on the hearts of our people to, to be working in the ministries in these ways. He's, he's brought new families. Uh, we've talked about it before, but did you know new families are joining us during COVID uh, despite learning how to do technology some of these things for the very first time he is bringing families who they don't just want to sit and watch online they want to be involved they want to help uh, see god build his kingdom here at calvary it's beautiful slowly but surely he's building up our leadership team uh, the chemistry the the brotherly love that our elders have the the staff team we've got a bunch of interns it's so much fun we, we have nate now uh, he's building up our leadership team did you realize that event that Anna talked about that we had, this outreach event for Village of Hope? Did you know 40 volunteers almost, 40 volunteers from Calvary helping to make sure people know that, hey, we want to take care of your needs. We don't just want to preach at you. We want to care for you. We want to love you. And, and you know who loves you even more than we do is God. 40 volunteers caught the vision. They realized we want to be a community who's for the community. God is raising up apes in the church of Jesus. And it's a beautiful thing, people realizing we're, we're kind of like the apostles. Yeah, we haven't been given this, I, this job to build the church like the original apostles, but we are sent like they are. And it's not just a leadership team who does that. It's not just paid staff. It takes a whole church. It's a team effort. And, and yesterday, that's a picture of this team effort. But you might be thinking to yourself, okay, I'm a sent one. <laughs> How can I be sent if I'm not allowed to go anywhere? You raise a very valid question. You might have to get creative like Peter. Think about literally his situation. Why is he writing a letter? Because he couldn't get out to the people that he was talking to. And so he sends a courier, probably Sylvanus or Silas, sends him out with this letter from church to church, from province to province, from house to house, saying, here's what Peter's saying to encourage you. And for us, if we're sent ones, if we really believe that we, we should be on mission, on assignment for Jesus, it might be time to pull out the homemade cards. <laughs> might be time for us to make some phone calls, to figure out ways to, to use the means that we have now and get creative to get the message out. See, we can look at our circumstances, our suffering and uh, our stress and, and the situation we're in right now, and we can say, we can just ask, why God? Or we could just tweak the question slightly and say, what God? What would you have me do in this situation? We started a care team this last year, and we've been reaching out to people in our church family who just really do have the gift of encouragement and who have this ability to shepherd or care and take care of people's needs. And, and we've been asking them, hey, our elders are, are trying to call and trying to care well for people. Our pastors are doing that. We have life group leaders who are doing that. But would you join a team that's dedicated to making phone calls and, and to just praying with people on the phone and letting them know that Calvary, your church family, is thinking about you and cares about you? 
This is a team that we started. It's one of the ways that during COVID we realized is a unique opportunity and, and we are sent and we need to take care of each other. So what do we do? And this is one of the things that we started. If you'd ever want to be a part of that team, talk to our friend, Pastor Bud. I'm sure he would love to hear from you. But maybe you're kind of thinking, Peter offers us grace and peace and he's trying to encourage us and he says, okay, go, you're sent, but you're scattered, but you're still sent. It's not very encouraging, Peter. But what might encourage you and what Peter would argue is even if you're scattered, even if you feel like, how could I be sent right now? God has you exactly where he has you on purpose. God has you exactly where he wants you. And that might be hard for you to swallow being scattered. And, and that being scattered could be a part of God's plan. But Peter takes it a, a step further. He seems to imply in these verses that God actually put the whole thing together. He set this thing up. Look at the second line of the letter again. To God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces. In Greek, it's literally the elect exiled scattered ones. <laughs> You've been chosen to be scattered to be foreigners, to be dispersed. Did you see the language of God's control at the end of this verse? Elect, chosen, foreknowledge. God has you right where he wants you. He didn't wake up one day and think, shoot, I forgot COVID was going to be a thing. Here's what's true for Peter's readers and, and true for you if you believe in Jesus. God chose you. And he has you right where he wants you. We're the chosen. We're not the missing. We're not the forgotten. We're not the uh, ones who, who, you know, maybe long ago God cared about us. No, God, our Father, has his eye on us. And I know we can debate predestination and, and have a theological discussion about this. I'd be happy to chat with you. But for me... I find it comforting to know that God picked me way before I ever could have picked him. That God knew me even before I was born. To know that he loved me and he chose me. And I, I just see this as an opportunity to thank him. Thank you, God, for loving me and wanting to have a relationship with me. For watching over me, for keeping me, even when I feel scattered and scared. Then there's that idea of being an exile or, or a foreigner, you could say. This is a pattern that God uses in the Bible. Remember Abraham in the book of Genesis? God makes Abraham a covenant. He says, Abraham, you're going to be my chosen people and, and I'm going to bless your family. You're going to have more, to look up in the stars. You, you, you're going to have more descendants than that. I'm going to bless the nations through you. And then, you know, that's the part that we love to quote. That's the missions passage, right? Oh yeah, we need to bless the nations. Thank you, Abraham. Well, but what does he say after that? But first, your people are going to go for 400 years of slavery. First, your people are going to be exiles. They're going to be foreigners. And as a part of the plan, I'm going to bring them there. That's part of the plan. We just took a special offering last week for, for a family that we've come to dearly love that are ministering to the Kurdish people in the GTA and the greater Hamilton area. And they're doing amazing work, but, but their story is, is devastatingly sad. They, they were forced out of their own country. Could you imagine feeling like you don't belong in your own country? And then you get to a new country and everything <laughs> this new country does is backwards to how you would do it. And you feel like a foreigner. You feel like an exile in your own skin. By the way, the ministry, God is using it to flourish. And I'm so glad that we're supporting. Thank you, Calvary, for the way that you support ministries like this ministry to the Kurdish people and all of our missions that we're a part of. But that's a glimpse of what it feels like being a Christian in our world. At least if you're trying to live on assignment, living out your calling from Jesus. And why God would want us to go through that kind of suffering and trial is difficult to understand. But as we go through these trials and we keep our eyes fixed on God and we learn to trust him, it does something to our faith. He uses it to grow us. He uses it to draw us closer to him. That's why in verse 2 Peter says, we're chosen by the Father 
and we're sanctified by the Spirit. We're made holy. We're, we're caused to grow in our faith. We, we, in a real way, we're saved by the work of the Spirit. We're united with God through the work of the Spirit. We're given faith. Now, none of us enjoys standing out. Think of uh, when we used to go to work parties uh, with your spouse for your spouse's work, and you go there, and they have their own inside jokes, and they speak their own language, and you're like, ha, 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 I don't get it. Or, or think about on campus when it's pie day, and all the math and science students are making jokes, and you're like, I have no idea, man. I just came here for the pie. Nobody likes to stand out. Nobody likes to feel like a foreigner, but what Peter's telling us here is that Followers of Jesus should get used to being different. We're foreigners in our culture. This isn't our eternal home. And when you think about how hard it is to be a foreigner or to stand out, and, and some of us have been bullied. Some of us have gone through things where it's horrible what you face because you're different than other people. But I hope this gives you some encouragement. Jesus, Jesus, God's son, our savior, he knows what it's like to be a foreigner. Do you remember the beginning of the gospel of John? John says he, the word, talking about Jesus, came to his own, came to his own people, came to the humans that he made, and his own did not receive him. They rejected him. The God of the universe uh, not not only just leaves the, the perfect paradise that he had but he becomes a human okay that's already got to have him feeling so much less comfortable than he already was and then the humans that he made don't even want anything to do with him they said no we're good on our own but i came to offer you a way to be saved a way to have relationship with me forever i don't want it jesus knows what it's like to be a foreigner isn't that amazing news that's that's what we call the good news the gospel of jesus christ But it's not just that he knows what it's like to be a foreigner. If you've ever not fit in, if you've ever experienced uh, trying to follow Jesus, trying to trust him with your life and live differently for him, he can empathize. But more than that, he shed his blood so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could have a relationship with him forever, so that you'll never have to feel ever again like you don't belong. He did that so you'd know you fit in in his family. You belong. You're chosen. And that's what the end of verse 2 is talking about. Uh, According to God's foreknowledge, we've been chosen. We've been sanctified in the Spirit. The Spirit is helping us to grow more and more like Christ. For obedience in the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's an important note. For obedience to Jesus Christ. First and foremost, your calling is to obey Christ. Before you're a businessman or a farmer or an owner or a homemaker or a a cashier or uh, the drive-through person, before you're any of these things, you're a follower of Jesus. And your, your calling, your vocation is to live your life for him. And then we get to those concluding words. Grace And peace be yours in abundance. Grace is God's unmerited favor. God's kindness and mercy, though we did nothing to deserve it. Peace uh, is that word shalom. uh, The sense of completeness or wholeness being brought to your life. Abundance. More than you could ever need. Or you could say, may it be yours multiplied. Like you get the the point multiplier. Bonus (laughs) points. Why can a bunch of scattered people all over our region have grace and peace? God's scattered people can have grace and peace because we're chosen. We're chosen, and that should give us grace and peace. And so the question is, if my life doesn't have that grace, doesn't have that peace in it, Why not? Is my ability to exhibit God's grace to other people or to experience his peace in my life, is it conditional on my circumstances? It's easy to praise God when things are going away. You know, you think, yes! Thanks, God. 
when we can meet freely together, when you can go to the cottage anytime you'd like, when you can have friends over for dinner, oh, I miss that. Literally, you can go to school in person and not just online. It's easy to praise God for those things. But what about when life gets difficult? What about when your sunny days get a lot rainier? When you're feeling isolated? When the test results come back and they're positive? What about when we thought we were a lock for the job and we didn't get it? What about when work hasn't come in weeks, in months? Do you still have God's peace? Do you still have God's grace? Sadly, in my life, the answer is no, a lot more than I'd like it to be. And if you're a no in those situations, it's probably because you're not depending on your identity as someone who's chosen by God. And when life gets busy or difficult or things are turned upside down, we, we tend to cut things out that, that aren't the focus of what's right in front of us. And again, I'm speaking from experience. And for many of us, one of the things that goes is our time with God. We just get rid of our God time. But when you only do drive-by God time, you just try to squeeze it in, you know, while you're quickly in the car for a few minutes or as you're getting ready for work. When that's the only God time you have, it doesn't have a chance to stay seep in it's kind of like reading a book but only reading the subtitles and maybe a couple of sentences students are like i do that all the time what's wrong with that <laughs> it's kind of like watching a movie but you really just watch the trailer and, and you don't actually know what the book's about you don't really know the premise of the movie it's kind of like taking your tea and just taking the tea bag and bobbing it in a couple of times but if you don't let the tea bag just sit there and, and steep you're not going to experience the flavor. It's the same with God and his word and, and spending time praying to him. It's not a legalistic thing. You have to read your Bible this much. You have to pray this much. It's that if you don't spend time with the God who loves you and wants a relationship with you, if you don't just sit under his teaching, what he says in his word, if you don't talk to him and commit your day to him and say, God, what do you want me to do? Your kingdom, your will, your way. If we don't take time to do that, how... how how could we expect to experience his grace and his peace? It just doesn't make sense, does it? We won't. And so here's my question for you. Does your grace and peace come from your circumstances or from the fact that you're chosen by God? 